Good evening, everybody. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks, Rob, for, for organising and, and the invitation. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, a little story. Um, it's been really inspirational already listening to, to the presentation so far. Uh, and this really uh, is going to be all about the why, that why bit. So this is a scene from South Sudan in sub-Saharan Africa. Very tranquil place, nice and green. And there's actually the, one of the world's most isolated tribes that lives in South Sudan. They're called the Maban tribe. And the Maban tribe are pretty unique because they've never been exposed to any of the outside noise of the world. And in 1962, a researcher went out and sought this tribe because they wanted to test their hearing, of all things. And what they found was the 70-year-olds of the Maban tribe had hearing levels equivalent to 20-year-olds living in cities. That's quite interesting. We knew that about 50 or 60 years ago. If you consider the construction world, we do not live in South Sudan in that lush, quiet environment. At work and at home and at the weekends and the evenings, we bombard our ears with noises of all sorts. So why does this matter? Across Europe, there are 46 million people who are exposed to harmful and hazardous levels of noise every day at work. And as you can see, manufacturing is the number one culprit as far as exposing people to noise, shortly followed by construction. And in 2015, The Lancet published quite a fascinating report that showed of the top risk factors for dementia, the number one contributor to early onset dementia that could be prevented was hearing loss. Now, if you consider an aging population where the idea of retirement isn't really a thing anymore, we all are working longer, we all are living longer, and yet if we go to work and we are harmed in a way, that means we can't work for the full life period, then we have a very real problem on our hands. And this is borne out in the data that comes from the Department of Work and Pensions. This is the top 10 occupational diseases by employer liability insurance claim. You've got hand-arm vibration syndrome, mesothelioma, asbestosis, repetitive strain injury, things that we're all very familiar with. But actually, if you count, there's only nine up there. Number 10 is occupational deafness. And occupational deafness accounts for more than double all of the other occupational diseases combined. And yet it's very rare that you hear about occupational deafness or noise exposure as something that should be at the top of anybody's list. In 2014, 360 million pounds was spent on insurance claims for hearing loss and deafness alone. And that's a number that pales into insignificance when you consider the WHO's figure of three quarters of a trillion dollars for the cost of unaddressed hearing loss. That's for things like early retirement, early onset dementia care, hearing aids, lifetime hearing tests, lost productivity at work, the list goes on. And it's only recently that the World Health Organization has listed hearing loss and deafness as one of their top five public health issues that every country within the WHO has now signed up to addressing. And this is something that's going to be increasingly in the public eye. So when we send people out to work, specifically in the construction sector, we rely on their ability to use their senses to stay safe. We're very fortunate that we have five quite amazing senses, all connected by the brain. And we typically give people protective equipment to protect their senses, while of course still allowing them to do their work effectively and efficiently. You have a hard hat to protect your head, gloves to prevent cuts and abrasions on your hands, but you can still do your work through the sense of touch. We protect our lungs with face masks covering our mouth and our nose. We protect people's eyes at work with a blindfold. I've never seen somebody on site doing that. I hope you haven't either. Of course, we give people a pair of see-through goggles that allows them to see what they're doing while also being protected at the same time. A see-through pair of glasses makes perfect sense. When it comes to hearing, we give people ear defenders and earplugs. 
And this is an exact analogy for a blindfold on your ears. And the data is quite shocking. If you have a person with excellent hearing at work, in any three month period, there's a 2.4% chance of them having an accident at work. If they have a lot of trouble with their hearing, that percentage doubles to 4.8%. So let's just consider for a second what we're doing to a person when we give them a pair of foam earplugs or passive ear defenders. We immediately, but temporarily, give them a lot of trouble with their hearing, therefore increasing their risk of an accident. Something wrong here. So it makes sense to give them something that they can hear through for their hearing. And there these products exist. For those of you that like data and workplace health, you might be familiar with this one. This is the most recent statistics from the Health and Safety Executive around fatalities at work. It's a bit grim, but it's really important. Over 100 years ago, we as employers of people killed about 6,000 people a year at work. We've done a fantastic job over the last 100 years of getting that all the way down to just 160 people who we kill at work each year. And I'm sure we can all agree that one is too many when it's preventable. And what you'll notice is there's a sharp decline in these early years. And in the last 10 years or so, it's plateaued. And in fact, on some years, it's kind of gone up. So the question is why? When you look at what is causing those deaths at work, there's some interesting things that come out. The number one killer at work is falls from height. If you look at the next four, being struck by a moving vehicle, being struck by a moving object, contact with moving machinery, and being trapped by something collapsing, I would posit that these are all linked by a person's awareness of their environment. And while people at work in harmful environments, like construction sites, which is the number one contributor to these statistics, we're very good at giving people their vision at work. You would never give a person a blindfold at work for safety, if nothing else. And yet we do give people blindfolds for their ears, eliminating their 360 degree awareness of their environment. I think that we can make a huge dent in these numbers in the coming years by shifting away from passive hearing protection like foam earplugs and passive ear defenders to active hearing protection that allows you to hear what's going on in your environment. Standard. And sadly, about six months ago, there was this incident, which you may have, been, you may have seen in the news, where two rail workers were hit by a train and the interim report from the Rail Association Investig Investigation Board showed that they were wearing almost certainly their ear defenders. There were other issues that took place. But despite the train, which was travelling fast, sounding its horn for in total about 20 seconds, the two guys that were hit, it was actually three, the other one was just off to the side, only heard that train from one second away not long enough to get out of the way. If they were wearing active ear defenders, I think they'd be alive today. Why do I care and why am I talking about hearing? I started off life as an NHS audiologist. I worked with people who had lost their hearing in a clinical environment. I was doing hearing tests, I was giving them hearing aids. And the majority of people that I met had lost their hearing at work. And they would ask me, almost invariably, is there a cure? And I would always have to say, no, it's too late for you, I'm afraid. Here's some education, don't let it get worse. Give them a hearing aid, they come back every few months complaining about something to do with the hearing aid because there are a lot of problems with hearing aids. And this was an incredibly frustrating experience for me because the reason I went into healthcare was to help. So after that process, I decided that there's some evidence missing that means the occupational world where most people are losing their hearing is not able to do what they want to be able to do. There's not the evidence, there's not the health economics in place, the numbers aren't there. So I did a PhD in auditory neuroscience to produce that evidence. And it was in the second year of my PhD when I realised that 
In the same way that the clinical world was not the route to make change, it's a way to help people, but it's not a way to change people or change an industry. The academic world isn't either, because you produce information and evidence on a topic, and then you can spend the rest of your life telling people about that, trying to make change happen. You're just sharing information. Critical thing to be done, but that isn't where change happens. So in the second year of my PhD, I decided I was going to start learning about commercialization, industry, entrepreneurialism. Because I saw that as the third option besides politics. I didn't want to go into politics. So entrepreneurialism, going to build a business to solve this problem. This is the problem I'm passionate about. I've seen it firsthand. I've experienced it in my family. I've met thousands of people that have the problem. I know it intimately. I can do something about it. And that was the journey for the next five years. Up until four years ago, when I started EVE, Eve is founded with the mission to eliminate the isolation and loneliness caused by hearing loss. And we do that by addressing the root cause, which is exposure of noise at work. And in starting the company, first of all, we establish what is the status quo? Why is there such a problem? Managing the safety of workers and noise is broken. The traditional method involves complex equipment. It requires specialist knowledge. It's manual. It takes a lot of time and ultimately it's actually ineffective, simply because you take a snapshot at a point in time that is not today. And when we were starting to work with the construction industry, we understood that there's a much broader problem here around safety and change. This is a scene from a highway, and there was a first-hand account from a senior operative who said that you have civilian drivers on highways, they're not paying attention typically, and in this particular instance, a lorry drifted into the side of the, the work zone, took off the wing mirror. Of course, if somebody had been walking past, that would have been it. And the key thing is that that's the sort of thing that stays with an operative, stays with a person. It's an incredibly stressful environment working on a construction site or a highway, wherever it might be, with so many hazards around. And you can break this up into complex risk in a hazardous environment with colleagues who are trying to do work and people. You have human behavior. And all of that makes it very, very difficult to actually improve safety. It's really difficult. But what have we done about it? We launched a product that allows you to hear your environment while still being protected. And this is the key bit. You get data on real-time risk assessments. So rather than thinking every year I'm going to do a health assessment for a person and say, how much sicker are they? you can actually see the risk build up and intervene before it's too late. And that's done through smart algorithms and data collection that's collected from the headset, uploaded wirelessly for analysis by occupational hygienists and health and safety managers, ultimately producing a really effective system. And for those of you that are familiar with the health and safety side of construction, we'll also be familiar with the hierarchy of controls. And this is the way that people manage safety or manage operatives to stay safe in the construction sector, where you try and eliminate a hazard at source. That's the best way, the most effective way of eliminating a risk of exposure. If you can't do that, you try and substitute it for a different process, control it. And the last line of defense is the PPE. But I have a real problem with this hierarchy of controls because it completely ignores the idea of continuous improvement. When a project starts, people will go through this process. If they haven't been able to eliminate it, they get down to PPE and they issue the PPE. This needs to be continuous. You need to be getting data from the PPE that allows you to know where the hazard is so you can do something about it. And that doesn't currently happen except for sites where they use our equipment. So currently we focus on the UK construction industry. The thought leaders that you see up here are those that are using our equipment in some way, and we're very proud of working with them. They share our values. That's incredibly important to us because in order to change how you operate, you need to be thinking ahead. Thank you so much for your time.